Episode 111. Is this you? Kenneth didn't care who Bessie was. He also didn't care if she was left-handed. Although it surprised him to see her drawing on the bulletin board with her right hand, he just ignored it. He thought of it now. Bessie wasn't left-handed at all. Kenneth closed his eyes. Now that he pieced the details together, it seemed easier to understand. Bessie wrote extremely slowly with her left hand as if she was a beginner. He put down his fork, crossed out the BM 280 plus on the paper, and wrote a big question mark in its place. If her left hand was 280, what about her right hand? Paul was playing a game when he saw Kenneth put down his fork. After noticing his relaxed expression, Paul leaned over to glimpse what he had wrote. He couldn't tell what it was. The lines drawn by Kenneth were too strange. Paul wasn't a professional player and knew little about hand speed. Even if Chloe played with someone else, he wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a hand speed of 500 plus and 200 plus. A voice called through Kenneth's open bedroom door. Paul, Kenny, aren't you leaving? They looked up and saw Wendy leaning against the doorframe. Wait, Paul said. He pointed at Kenneth. Kenny hasn't eaten. I'm done, Kenneth said. He stood up and threw the rest of the rice into the rubbish bin. Then, he took the paper and followed them to the classroom. The school's medical office. When Michael returned, Bessie was leaning on the side of the table, observing the grass in the almost dehydrated glass dish. Here, Bessie, Marvin said. He handed her a cup of tea and then pointed to the grass in the glass dish. He lowered his voice and asked, Is this day lily yours? Bessie stood with her back to the window. The sun was glaring, but she felt cold. She turned her head against the light and raised an eyebrow. What did you just call it? Day lily. It's only available at the auction house. Marvin thought for a while and then asked, Did Michael give it to you? Oh, Bessie nodded casually and then said, My deskmate gave it to me. It smells good. It helped her sleep well. Your deskmate? Marvin immediately thought of the naive Mary and was a little confused. How could it be? He took two steps and picked up Michael's glass bottle on the table. After turning it around, he still couldn't find the code number. It was probably fake. Marvin originally thought that it was Michael who had given it to Bessie, but now that he knew it was fake, he treated it casually. Samuel kicked the door open and sat down at the dining table. He crossed his legs and handed the coffee to Bessie, who placed it by the cup of tea. Bessie, are you friends with Scarlet? He couldn't fathom it. One was cold, evil, and even had the sense of a cynical and unruly gangster. The other was obedient, quiet, and looked like an outstanding student at a glance. He couldn't see how they could be friends. Bessie sipped her coffee. Yeah. She must have good eyesight. Samuel laughed as he picked up his fork. Bessie shot her eyes at him upon hearing the comment. Her look was sharp as she raised a light eyebrow. Don't provoke her. Her tone was very serious. Michael remembered after knowing Bessie for so long that she was agile and only got injured because of Scarlet. You're protecting her? Bessie continued to drink the coffee, and no matter what Samuel asked next, she kept quiet. After a long while, Samuel seemed to hear light and fleeting words. The voice was too low, but he thought he heard the word sin, although it wasn't clear. After washing his hands, Michael walked over. He paused when he entered the room. Samuel opened his mouth and was about to say something to clear matters up. Michael put his hand on the chair, pulled it out, glanced at him and ordered, Go wash your hands. After dinner, Bessie continued to lie on the table and practice her writing. She wrote slowly with her left hand while supporting her chin with her right hand. Her pretty face was full of impatience, making her appear unruly. Michael was polishing the glass inside. He wasn't very professional. He sat on the edge of the table while holding the glass with his long, clean fingers. He lowered his eyebrows and seemed a little lazy and relaxed. Marvin saw Bessie stop halfway and felt like her spirits seemed low. Look at how meticulous Michael is. It's as if the daylily is real. 
Marvin moved a stool and sat down next to Samuel. He held his phone and sent a message to Patrick. Samuel was looking at the tickets for this Saturday's exhibition game and counting the time left to head to Evanston. What day, Lily? Marvin replied. Oh, it's what Joshua wears all year round. I don't know the specifics, but last year I accompanied Joshua to an auction site. It wasn't expensive, about two million, and it lasted less than a month. Samuel paused and thought that Marvin was probably high. How was two million not expensive? Even large companies found it difficult to have a flow of two million in a month. But Bessie's should be fake, Marvin blurted. He thought for a while, lowered his voice and said, I didn't see a code on it. He had bought it with Joshua before, so he was naturally very clear that this kind of external sale had a clear code to prevent counterfeiting. Bessie finished practicing her writing, then pulled her hat on her head and went to English class. Michael finished polishing the glass and put it aside. Then he pulled open the glass door and exited the room. He leaned on the chair she had been sitting in and reached out to flip through her notebook. Her handwriting had indeed improved a lot. After a long while, he flexed his fingers, knocked on the table and said, Marvin, I want to look through 712's information again. Marvin went to get the information. Michael turned directly to one page and stared at it for a long time. This was the page that had Bessie's name previously. I couldn't find Benjamin Turner's daughter. She appeared at the scene, but the last piece of information is already here. Marvin glanced at it solemnly. I guess it was the Poison Wolf's revenge. Those in the Poison Wolf group aren't very good people. Otherwise, they are probably very well protected, but the latter is unlikely. Nobody would go to this extent for the daughter of a drug police officer, right? She wasn't even a big character. The Poison Wolf group had always been ruthless. After investigating for a long time with Harvey, they only found the origin of their stronghold in Chicago. Benjamin, suffocated to death. Benjamin's wife, suffocated to death. Benjamin's daughter, unknown. There were three graves at the scene and one wasn't filled. Some people speculated that Benjamin's daughter was buried somewhere else. From beginning to end, his daughter's name wasn't revealed, nor did the CIA have any news of her whereabouts. Michael leaned back, reached out to cover his eyes, and said, Marvin, have you ever heard of the multiple-choice question for the train tracks? Suppose there was a speeding train in the distance. There are two tracks in front, one tied to one person and the other tied to two people. You particularly respect two of these three people, and one is your friend. You're only given ten seconds to choose to save one side with the remote control. How would you choose? Marvin froze. You want me to choose between you, Samuel, and Patrick? He frowned. I won't do it. If you don't do it, the three of us will die together. Michael looked away. In the end, you want me to choose between killing two people or one? Marvin paused and then mumbled. Michael, you're so cruel. Even if he chose, he would go crazy from his decision. Michael slowly closed his eyes and clenched his hands on the table. He leaned on the back of the chair and stopped talking. When Bessie got to English class, afternoon self-study had already ended. Mary was writing on her physics paper and was almost done. When she saw Bessie, she immediately passed her the paper. Copy it quickly. Kenny will come to collect the paper later. Bessie didn't want to write, but since Mary insisted... She took a pen and slowly copied Mary's answer to her physics paper. When Kenneth collected the paper, Mary looked up and explained it to Kenneth. Previously, when he saw Bessie copying, Kenneth would leave without a word and not care if she handed it in. But today, he stopped out of the blue and waited for her to finish copying without the slightest hint of impatience. Mary was a little surprised, but didn't say anything. She turned sideways and looked at Bessie's paper in surprise with one hand on her chin. Bessie, your handwriting has improved. It looks pretty good. Bessie's handwriting with her left hand had always been slow and wasn't very good. Recently, Mary found that her handwriting had gotten better and better. She wrote stroke by stroke profoundly and even had her style. 
not like the style of an elementary school student at all. Bessie finished writing and handed the paper to Kenneth. Kenneth glanced down and saw that her handwriting had improved more than just a little. Her handwriting had not changed in the past ten years, so how would it have changed so much in the short course of two months? Kenneth put Bessie's paper on the top and pursed his lips. It was because she rarely used her left hand to write. He handed the stack of papers to the physics teacher. He went back to his seat, took out his mobile phone, and searched for Toby on Twitter. He clicked on BM's homepage through the link of Toby's Twitter page. Other than this person, Kenneth really couldn't think of anyone else who could make Toby say this person was better than him. Bessie met almost all the criteria, except for her hand speed. When she competed against Chloe the night before, Kenneth had noticed that Bessie's hand speed was only 280 plus. Everything could be hidden, but hand speed couldn't. But now... Kenneth held a pen and drew lines below B and BM. His eyes flickered as he lowered his head. His fingers clenched slightly and shook a little. Bessie, where's the flower around your neck? Mary pulled out her mathematics materials and turned her head over. Bessie leaned slightly against the wall with her beautiful eyebrows lowered and said in low spirits, I let someone make a specimen. Just throw it away if it's spoiled. We have lots of those at home. Mary thought for a moment and whispered in embarrassment, My father is a flower farmer. Oh, Bessie nodded. You've seen my father before. He's a construction worker. Mr. Scott walked into the class from the corridor with materials in his hands. After class, he knocked on Bessie's table and motioned for her to follow him. This is the three-day leave you asked for. Mr. Scott handed the absence note to Bessie. Thank you, teacher. Bessie took it and looked down at it. The note had been approved. Bessie put away the note and walked to her seat. Kenneth also took out a piece of paper. Mr. Scott, I want to take leave. This was strange. They were asking to take leave one after another. Mr. Scott clipped his materials under his armpit. How many days? From next Monday to Wednesday, three days. Kenneth handed Mr. Scott a note with the reason for the leave application written on it. Mr. Scott took it and said casually, Monday to Wednesday? It was the same time as Bessie's leave. He looked down and saw that Kenneth had written a detailed reason for his leave. He was going back to Evanston. Bessie had been more carefree and had written two very arrogant words. Private business. She didn't even write anything to coax Mr. Scott. Kenneth nodded and didn't explain more. Mr. Scott reached out and gave him a note. After school in the afternoon... Paul took his basketball, bounced it a few times, and waited for Kenneth to come out. Kenneth held his mobile phone and didn't leave immediately. He looked up and saw that Bessie was still sitting in the seat. She supported her chin with one hand and flipped through her books. She was visibly impatient. After thinking for a time, Kenneth pulled his chair and stood up. Paul originally thought Kenneth was coming out, but he didn't expect him to walk directly towards Bessie with his mobile phone. Paul stood up straight and immediately chased him, calling, Hey, Kenny. Kenneth ignored him. He enlarged the photo that he kept on his phone and placed it in front of Bessie. What's the matter? Bessie asked in an annoyed voice. She held her books in one hand and turned over to face him a little impatiently. Paul frowned and glanced over. The enlarged photo on Kenneth's phone wasn't very clear. The pixels weren't good and it was probably from a few years ago. There was a girl's back in the picture. She was wearing black clothes that looked like the OST jacket and had a cap on her head. They couldn't see the face, and even from the back view, she looked casual. Is this you? Kenneth asked pointedly, placing both hands on the table. He lowered his head slightly, his eyes emotionless. B. Episode 112 a bad omen. Kenneth's voice was quite light, but his hands pressed tightly on the table. Paul threw the basketball onto the ground, looked at Kenneth and then at Bessie. He didn't know what these two people meant. B? Who was that? There was no change in Bessie's expression. She just looked sideways, cold and dry. No. Then she stood up with her head slightly lowered and the hair on her forehead slipped across her brow. 
Make way. You're so troublesome. Kenneth wanted to say something, but the phone in his pocket rang. He took it out and looked at it. It was Anne. Bessie passed by him while he was distracted. Kenneth squeezed his phone and thought for a while before answering Anne's call. Kenny, have you taken your leave? When are you coming to Evanston? I'll come to the airport to pick you up and have my aunt book a hotel for you. I've taken my leave, but Paul might not go. Kenneth stared at Bessie's back and said, I don't need you to pick me up. Anne quipped, No need? After hearing that Paul wasn't coming, she paused and said nothing else. Kenneth said a few more things and then hung up. He chased after Bessie, but she had already gone downstairs. Paul came out with his phone and looked from down the corridor. Kenny, what's the matter with B? She used to be a member of OST. One week before the Winter Game three years ago, she took a phone call and left, saying nothing. After that, nobody could contact her again. Kenneth looked downstairs and saw Bessie was pulling on her cap and calling someone. Paul touched his head. So Bessie is B? Why haven't I heard of that before? Kenneth said, Have you seen Bessie's arena win rate? I don't know. Paul bounced his basketball with his other hand. He had only seen Bessie's account last night. The data is 100%. Every player in the US and abroad knew of the solo madman B, who had countless fans. Kenneth looked down and then said lightly, If you have the time, you can ask the members of OST about their team's hand speed ranking. It's not that you haven't heard of it, it's because she's from the first district. Let me ask you, have you seen an account from the top ranks? The members of the top rank are all mixed internationally. Kenneth glanced at Paul again. In the entire OST team, only Toby is in the top rank. He probably has 17 stars. Bessie should be in the top ranks too, but I didn't see clearly until yesterday. Fans of esports shouldn't say they've never heard of the solo madman B. She's a lone wolf type character. Just search for her on the internet and you'll know how popular she is. Kenneth was rarely so talkative. Poker tournament was very popular now, and the first district had already closed three years ago. There weren't many people online, but there were many secluded masters in the region. Paul only reacted. He understood what Kenneth had meant by writing B and 700 plus. So that was Bessie's hand speed? Toby's hand speed was 600 plus and he was already so popular that his fans could line up in a circle around the earth. When the rumor appeared on Twitter that Chloe's hand speed was faster than Toby's, she had soared to 3 million fans and had exploded in popularity. If the fans of OST knew Bessie was not in the top ranks but also had a hand speed that exceeded Toby's, chaos would probably ensue. After school, Bessie went directly to her bedroom and turned on the computer on the table. She poured herself a glass of water, then sat in a chair and hit a few keys. After the editor came up, she reached out and started typing. She finished after less than 20 minutes. Bessie turned on her video and connected to Jared. I've settled on the questions. I'll send it to your email now. Bessie leaned on the back of the chair, picked up the glass of water, and casually took a sip. She didn't turn on her camera and only used the speaker. Jared was smiling and couldn't suppress the joy in his tone. You're fast. Send it to me quickly. Bessie drank water with one hand and held the mouse in the other. Her movements slow. Let me warn you, my questions are a little perverted. You should contemplate it and then decide if you want to use it. It's okay. It didn't bother Jared. Aren't you afraid of not recruiting anyone? Bessie put down the glass of water and sent the documents to Jared. Not recruiting anyone? You seem to think too lowly of yourself. Jared was silent for a while, and then he laughed. With the release of your reputation as the lone wolf, countless people are vying for the spot. You're still afraid that nobody will be recruited. Bessie clicked send. Fine, as long as you're not afraid. She heard Mary and Riley's voices outside the door, so she leaned over and turned off the speaker. Look at it closely, my roommate is back. She didn't wait for Jared to answer. As soon as the computer screen was dark, Mary pushed the door open and handed her a lollipop. I saw Scarlet on the way and she asked me to bring this to you. Bessie nodded, peeled the paper off, and put it into her mouth. 
Saturday morning, Bessie went to the school doctor's office to say goodbye. I'm going out. Bessie ate her oatmeal slowly and estimated the time. I'm leaving this afternoon and I'll be back next Thursday. Michael handed the finished specimen to Bessie, picked up the coat hanging on the chair and threw it on the sofa. Where? I'm visiting someone. Bessie put down her fork. He's a little persistent, so I'm going to persuade him to stop. Michael raised an eyebrow and glanced at her. He pursed his lips and chuckled. We're leaving tonight as well. We will be back next week. Do you want me to send you back? Samuel glanced at Bessie with a hand on his chin. He probably thought she was returning to Fairfield. Bessie shook her head. There was another flower hanging around her neck. Marvin paused when he handed a cup of tea to Bessie. Bessie, on your neck. Marvin pointed to the flower. Is it a new one? Yeah, my deskmate gave me another one. Bessie reached out and turned the flower around on her neck, then asked, Do you want one too? Marvin shook his head and stared at the flower. It looked too realistic. It was so realistic that he didn't believe it was fake. My deskmate said that she has a garden in her house, and even if she doesn't use it, her kitten would secretly eat it. Bessie propped her legs up and leaned back. If you want, I can ask her to bring you one. A garden? Marvin immediately shook his head. There's no need. He was a person with ideas and wouldn't use high imitation goods even if he was poor. Oh, Bessie huffed. Since he didn't want it, she didn't force him. After saying goodbye, Bessie went back to her bedroom to clean up. She packed a little. She just stuffed a few clothes, a book, and a water bottle into her bag. Instead of leaving immediately, she went to the hospital. It was Saturday, so Grace and Andrea were both there when Bessie arrived. Grace was talking to Andrea. Anne originally wanted me to bring Pete and Susan to Evanston, but there aren't many concert tickets, so I'll bring them next time. Susan heard this and her mood fell into the abyss before she felt happy. Anne had sent two tickets, so shouldn't Grace have another one in her hands? Who was she bringing? Andrea just smiled. Why would you bring them there? They would only embarrass you. Mom? Susan frowned. I'm going to the airport to fly to Evanston later, so I came earlier today. Grace finished speaking, turned her head and glanced at her. Are you coming with me? Susan was talking to Bertha when she heard this and involuntarily looked up at Bessie. She pursed her lips. Bessie leaned against the table and stood lazily. No. You? Grace was speechless. She walked to Bessie's side, took out a ticket from her pocket and handed it to her. This ticket is for you. It's your choice whether you want to go. Bessie raised an eyebrow. Before she could speak, Bertha leaned on the pillow and coughed twice. Bessie, go to the doctor and get me two pills. Bessie didn't want to argue with Grace in front of her grandmother. She took her cell phone and went directly to Bertha's attending doctor. Bertha deliberately directed Bessie away to prevent them from arguing. Bessie was getting impatient with Grace. After Bessie left, Grace stared at Bertha disapprovingly. Mom, you're letting her go again. When will she progress like this? She even said that she would go to Northwestern University. She's fastidious but incompetent, and doesn't she think small? Many people are waiting to make fun of her. The Smith family and the Harper family. After hearing Grace, Susan clenched her hands and looked up at Grace in shock. So, she didn't tell her aunt about her midterm results? She didn't understand what Bessie was thinking. Bertha lowered her head to drink water and paused. She looked up at her with bright eyes. Bessie... Bessie wants to enter Evanston. A violent coughing spell interrupted her thought. She almost coughed up her lungs. Her pale face showed abnormal redness. After a long while, she stopped coughing and gripped Grace's wrist with hands that were full of gorges. Bessie said she wants to go to Northwestern University. Mom, don't get too excited. Grace patted her back nervously. She just heard that Anne wants to enter Northwestern University, so she said the same thing. Forget about her previous grades. Given her current attitude and how she doesn't want to be an art student, 
Do you think she can enter Northwestern University? Bertha coughed again and leaned on the pillow. She glanced out the door with her turbid eyes. Regardless, Bessie is so smart, she can enter Northwestern University. Grace didn't know what to say. The old lady had been biased towards Bessie since she was young and always believed in whatever she said. Just talk about it amongst yourselves. Don't bring it up in front of outsiders. Grace picked up her bag. Lest outsiders mock us. Then she instructed Andrea to take good care of Bertha and bolted out the door. When Grace left, Bertha remembered something. She took a dilapidated box from under the pillow and handed it to Susan. Put this in your cousin's bag. She laid back and closed her eyes. She was extremely tired from coughing for so long. Susan looked at it. It was very heavy and she didn't know what was inside, but she wasn't too interested. Bessie's bag was on the edge of the table. Susan opened the zipper and a book fell out of it. Susan put the wooden box in the black bag and bent down to pick up the book. It was a brand new book in a foreign language, and she couldn't tell what language. When she picked it up and turned the pages, two tickets fell out. Susan glanced at the two tickets and saw they were VIP tickets to a concert. This wasn't something that Bessie could get, so she figured Anne had probably sent them to her. Susan's hand tightened on the tickets, and she pursed her lips. Bessie had said she wasn't going to Evanston and didn't want to watch the concert, so what on earth was with these two tickets? Susan, why are you taking such a long time to pick up the book? Pete had been sitting in a chair by the window, memorizing phrases. Susan didn't speak and just clutched the tickets in her hand. Bessie held two pills as she thought of what the doctor had said. She stayed in the corridor for a long while before pushing the door of Bertha's room open. Once inside, she saw Susan holding her book while standing beside the table. It didn't bother Bessie. She handed the pills to Andrea in a rather bad mood. She let her put the pills in water for Bertha to drink. Why didn't you give me the opportunity if you didn't want to attend the concert? Susan bit her lip and continued resentfully. You heard your aunt saying that she wanted to bring me and Pete along. So why didn't you give us these two tickets? Pete stood up and took the book from Susan's hand. What nonsense are you talking about? It's not nonsense. Susan walked over to Bessie and threw the two tickets in front of her face. These are VIP tickets for the concert. Where else could she have gotten them from other than Anne? Episode 113, Back in the Capital. Andrea was stirring the pills in Bertha's water and lifted her head when she heard the conversation. She limped over anxiously to where the tickets lay on the floor. Susan, Anne only brought back two tickets. How could these be the tickets she sent? What are you doing? She squatted down to pick up the tickets. Hurry and apologize to your cousin. <coughs> Bertha woke up from her sleep. Susan regretted it after throwing the tickets. She remembered rumors about Bessie in all aspects. I was the one who gave Bessie the tickets. Bertha coughed again and said in a weak voice, The teacher who taught Bessie last time mailed them to her. How could Bessie have a teacher who would mail her such tickets? Bessie glanced at Bertha and took a step aside. She lifted her chin, gestured at the door and said emotionlessly, Get out. Susan glanced at Bessie and pursed her lips. I'm sorry, Bessie. Bessie took the tickets and the book that Pete handed her. She stuck the tickets between the book pages, put them back in her bag and repeated to herself, Get out. Neither Andrea nor Pete spoke. Bertha just closed her eyes slightly. The whole ward was standing on Bessie's side. Susan ran out crying, with reddened eyes, saying nothing. Bessie, I'm sorry. Andrea glanced in Susan's direction and handed the ticket to Bessie. Susan, I didn't teach her well. Andrea sat on a chair on the side and covered her eyes. Her husband was still in a vegetative state. She usually had to work or rush to the hospital, so she indeed neglected her two children. It's okay, you didn't teach Pete either, but he's still very good. Bessie picked up her bag and flung it behind her back, her tone indifferent. 
She left after bidding farewell to Bertha. Pete accompanied her out silently. When the elevator door opened, he spoke without expression. I saw your score on the honor list. Bessie was speechless. 646. It's a good score. Bessie remained speechless. The lousy feeling of suppressed anger because of Susan suddenly dissipated. Pete glanced at her again, pursed his lips and continued. Give me back Luke Song's notebook. Bessie was speechless again. After leaving the hospital, Bessie didn't go to the airport. She went to the bank and then took a cab to the airport. It was 4.55 in the afternoon at Evanston Airport. Grace got off the plane and saw Anne waiting for her. Anne! Grace waved to Anne and sped up. Anne tilted her head and introduced her to the man in a black suit. Mom, this is the Perez family's driver. Grace looked over and the man took the suitcase in her hand. He wore a formal suit and had a stony expression that seemed to come from a powerful aura. She was shocked. She didn't expect the Perez family's driver to be so different. Anne was used to it and just raised an eyebrow as she glanced behind Grace. Mom, Bessie didn't come? Yeah. Grace frowned and followed Anne out. She said in agitation, Don't talk about her. Bertha always said she was young and there was no need to hurry. But Anne was one year younger than her, so this wasn't a problem of age at all. She wasn't comprehensive, never grasped opportunities, and even gave up on the violin when she was young. She really shouldn't be wasting time on her. The two of them got into the car together and headed to a hotel instead of the Perez family's house. Although she felt a little uncomfortable, Grace still sighed in relief. She couldn't even cope with Elise alone and would be breathless if she had to deal with all the Perez family. The hotel security guard took the suitcase into Grace's hands. Mom, check-in is already done. This is the largest hotel in Evanston. I've reserved the 56th floor for you, and you can overlook the night scene from there. Anne followed her into the elevator. I'll send you back to your room, then I'll go back. Grandpa Perez is returning to the Perez family tonight, and they want me to play the violin for him. Then you should hurry and practice. Grace knew that Grandpa Perez liked Anne and didn't dare to take up her time. Anne swiped the door with the card and said lightly, It's not urgent. They can wait for a while. She must have something to rely on if she dared to say this. Grace realized that Anne was much better off in the Perez family's house than she had ever imagined. Mom, look outside. Anne opened the curtains with the remote control and stood by the glass window. She looked at the night scene and turned sideways with her eyes flashing. The Perez family is only the tip of the iceberg in Evanston. In the capital, the Perez family can only reach the lowest circle. Early winter was cold and night came fast. But outside, there was a display of lights. Grace unscrewed a bottle of water to take a sip. When she heard this, she glanced at Anne. Anne turned around again, took out her phone, and smiled. It's a pity that Bessie didn't come. Bessie arrived at the airport. Wearing a white sweater and a coat, she pulled the sweater's hood over her head and carried her backpack directly towards the taxi. First, she sent a message to Samuel to inform him she had arrived at her relative's house. Samuel, who was already on the plane, sent her an okay then he glanced at Michael, who was in front of him. Michael, Bessie arrived at her relative's house. Michael responded lazily and then pulled the small blanket over his body. At the Evanston airport, Bessie put her phone in her pocket. It rang again. Bessie put on her headphones. It was a call from Daniel. I'm back in the U.S. at the Capitol. Daniel's voice was a little lazy and he sounded tired. I'll go back to Chicago to see you tomorrow. Then I'll get some tools to find your grandma. Bessie lined up for a bus and pulled down her sweater's hood. She leaned on the barrier next to her and stretched out her long legs in an unruly manner. No need. I'm in Evanston. Daniel laughed and poured himself a glass of water. Then I won't go to Evanston. Evanston is a wolf den. There are many people there who want to catch me. Yeah. The crowd moved and Bessie saw that it was almost her turn, so she took two steps forward. Wait for me to return to Chicago. As for my grandma, you don't have to go over for now. Her voice sounded unfamiliar. Daniel paused and stood up from the sofa. 
Are you all right? She has excessive radiation and abnormal organ aging. Bessie looked at the taxi and said lightly, She's allergic to most of the drugs. Daniel almost spat out his water. He coughed and said, Your grandma has radiation? What radiation? The computer radiation from your neighbor who repairs computers? How many times must I say that he doesn't repair computers? The taxi stopped in front and Bessie pulled open the door. She got in and corrected Daniel. Daniel responded casually, Okay, okay, he doesn't, fine. He hung up. There was a message from Brian on Twitter. Bessie, Paul told me that you took leave today. Did you go to Evanston? Bessie slowly replied to him with one word. Yeah. In Chicago, Brian was eating steak with Paul. He put down his fork and knife and wiped his hands with a tissue before calmly dialing a phone number. Buy me the latest flight to Evanston. Paul sat with his legs crossed opposite him. When he heard this, he looked up. Why are you all going to Evanston? If it wasn't true that Brian didn't like Anne, Paul would have thought that he was going to watch her performance. They sent the flight information to Brian's phone number. Brian squinted slightly and looked down. He put down his fork and knife and said in an easygoing manner that didn't sound like a domineering school bully at all. Enjoy your meal. I'm going to the airport. The Capitol. Daniel hung up the phone and leaned on the sofa. He lowered his head and sent a message asking Bessie to send Bertha's case to him. He stood up, took out his computer and copied a web address from the desktop. He entered another web page. This website was the Hacker Alliance website he bought for $100,000. He purchased it from the CIA. There were too many people investigating him, and the CIA was so annoyed. They gave a website address to him after receiving their requested price. He opened the website, and a white page appeared. The computer camera opened automatically and, after verifying his face, logged indirectly to the customer's background. It showed the order that Daniel had placed a few days ago. Daniel took a sip of water and then put down the glass. He clicked the confirm button and put his fingers on the keyboard to type a good comment. Dr. Brown, your ability to act is too strong, and you solved my problem in a short time. The name Isaiah Carter sounds a little bad, but other than that, everything is nice. The other party directly refunded the money, and then a message came. We haven't taken action yet, though. Episode 114 Who Does Bessie Know in the Medical Department? Daniel's hand paused on the keyboard. He stared at the sentence, leaned back, drew a cigarette from the pack in his pocket, and narrowed his eyes. After a while, he got up again and went from the bedroom to the living room downstairs. He took his medicine box and removed a black cell phone inside. Then he made a call. Daniel lit his cigarette and found a table to lean on. After waiting a few minutes, he received a list. It was already 8 o'clock when Bessie reached the hotel, so she took a shower. She only saw the box in her bag when she took out her books. Bessie stopped rubbing her hair and held the book in her other hand. After a while, she zipped her bag up. Then she took out her phone and sent a video call to Bertha. Pete was still memorizing phrases in Bertha's ward. Grandma, I'm home. Bessie stood in front of the glass window, wearing a bathrobe, with her hair still wet. She turned the camera around and let it face the night view outside. Bertha's mood at night was much better than in the morning. She looked at the night view on her phone and asked, Have you seen Grandpa Jake? I didn't tell him I was coming. If Brian knows I call him Grandpa Jake, he would surely be unhappy, Bessie said. It has been so many years, and yet he's still angry. Bertha commented, seeming to laugh. After a pause, she explained, Mr. Williams also contacted me last time. He hopes you can continue to learn from an excellent teacher and not ruin your prospects because of his family. Mr. Grint also visited me a few times. It's up to you whether to continue. I sent Stephen to the hospital and yet Mr. Williams doesn't hate me. Bessie didn't answer and just lifted her head to look out the window. 
Two sofas sat by the glass window, and she sat on the armrest of one of them, her other hand holding the back of the chair. At the mention of Stephen, Bertha's disgust was obvious. She didn't want to talk about him and simply said, Think about it. They hung up. Pete hung up the video. Then he picked up the English workbook that he set aside earlier. After turning two pages, he raised his head. His facial features were exquisite, and his eyebrows were slightly convex. His eyes were as cold as a lake, and his thin lips were slightly pursed. Grandma, that year, why did Bessie... Why did she hit Stephen? He had heard that Stephen was covered in blood when they carried him out. Yet, the White family said nothing. Pete had just entered junior high school, so he was unclear about a lot of things. He's a disgusting being. It'll only dirty our hands to kill him. Bertha closed her eyes and suddenly remembered something. Do you know Mr. Clark? Pete put Bertha's phone aside and looked up. Which Mr. Clark? The one beside your cousin, the good-looking child. Bertha opened her eyes again and said in a soft voice, He's very polite. Pete glanced at Bertha silently. His grandma's impression of people was that they were good-looking or passable. Other than that, she had completely no impression of them at all. Pete sighed after hearing Bertha call the man good-looking. He had heard his mother say that when Grace brought James home, the whole family was dissatisfied. Only Bertha had no objection and even said that he was good-looking. Yeah, he's a doctor at the school hospital, Pete said with a yawn as he tucked her in. Bertha nodded in satisfaction. Doctors are good. Doctors are wonderful. No wonder he has such beautiful hands. Just like your cousin. Pete was speechless. The Perez family in Evanston. It was a four-story villa with a garden outside in the prosperous area of Evanston. Anne stayed in a room on the third floor. She held her violin in one hand and phoned Thomas with the other. The violin was the one she had used in Chicago, but a famous teacher hired by David had repaired the string. Before going downstairs, Anne stood at the end of the corridor on the third floor and called Thomas. Thomas, have you received the tickets? Are you coming to see me with Jacob the day after tomorrow? Thomas's voice was faint. It depends on the situation. I might not have time. Thomas's attitude towards her had become icy since the last time, and her relationship with the Smith family seemed to revert to the freezing point, like when she first came. Anne clenched her hands tightly and pretended to be relaxed. Okay. Goodbye then, Thomas. She hung up and closed her eyes before heading downstairs. There weren't many people downstairs. Elise sat on the sofa wearing a purple dress and a white fox fur shawl around her shoulders. Anne, come down quickly. Elise smiled slightly when she saw Anne coming down and turned her head. Grandpa Perez has been waiting for you for a long time. Anne held her violin and nodded politely to them. After she finished a song, Grandpa Perez nodded slightly, the smile on his face bigger. You've improved. Not bad. The girl sitting on the other side didn't seem to appreciate it. After playing on her phone for a long time, she stood up when the song was over. I can't understand it, but it sounds a little like Noah Hyber's early debut song in the Dark Album series. What do you know? Grandpa Perez stopped smiling. Go upstairs immediately and let's see if you have the dignity of a lady from the Perez family. The girl shrugged her shoulders and went directly upstairs. Don't listen to her nonsense. You're so young yet you already have deep emotions. Grandpa Perez nodded and smiled. Mr. Grint likes spiritual apprentices, so don't be too stressed and just play normally. After returning to the third floor, Elise gathered her shawl and said, Don't listen to Tiffany Walker. She's already in the junior year, but the Perez family still refuses to let her join the company for an internship. Anne smiled and didn't speak but she took out her phone and searched for the early song in Noah Hyber's Dark Album series. Tiffany's words had given her a warning bell. What if the sheet music she had picked up was of a song? Fans of Noah Hyber were scattered all over the country. If it sounded familiar, all of his fans would drown her out. Your sister didn't come? Elise sat on the sofa in Anne's room and looked at the furnishings. 
Two jade vases sat next to the window with a European-style beige sofa in the middle. The room was exquisitely decorated. It wasn't much worse than Tiffany's room. Grandpa Perez liked Anne so much that the whole family was very polite to her. No, my mother said that my sister doesn't want to come. Anne found the sheet music for the song. Elise's expression changed a little, but there was a bit of scorn in her eyes. She knew about David's decision. She stopped talking about Bessie. When Elise left the room, Anne took out her headphones from the drawer and listened to the old songs one by one. The next day, Bessie got up early. After brushing her teeth and eating breakfast, she went downstairs with her black backpack. She stayed in an ordinary single room on the 28th floor. A staff member stood next to the elevator and bent over with a smile when he saw her. Hello, the banquet hall on the third floor is closed tonight, and the main entrance is closed as well. If you come back between 4 and 6 o'clock in the afternoon, please come in through gate 2. I'm very sorry about the inconvenience. It was probably because the family booked the banquet hall, so Bessie nodded and lowered her hood to express her understanding. The hotel wasn't far from Northwestern University. Bessie chose this place specifically. Instead of taking a taxi, she walked to the university. On the way, she received a local phone call from an unknown number. Bessie put on her headphones. Mr. Grint. Mr. Grint's voice sounded energetic. Where are you staying? Bessie didn't mention the name of the hotel. You don't need to come over. I have some other matters, so I'll find you when I'm done. Mr. Grint was still rehearsing a scene, so he waved to the staff and then walked to one side. He didn't answer Bessie and just said unhappily, You know my address, so why didn't you come over directly? It's your first time in Evanston and you're unfamiliar with the place. It's okay. Bessie put her hands on the headphones and stood by the road, waiting for the traffic lights. After she finished talking to Mr. Grint, the green light lit up and she followed the pedestrian road to the street in front. When Thomas saw Bessie, she was walking on the tree-lined road of Northwestern University. She was wearing a sweater with a hood over her head. She was looking down and she had her headphones plugged in on both sides, exposing only her cold chin and looking very cool. Even if they couldn't see her face, the people passing by looked at her subconsciously. Wait a moment, I have something to do. Thomas stopped walking and spoke to the young man beside him. Then he walked in Bessie's direction. Thomas trotted over quickly and stopped her. He raised an eyebrow slightly and asked, Why are you here? Are you here with your mother to watch the concert? In his opinion, Bessie wasn't such a person. Oh, Bessie looked up slowly. No, I'm here to find someone. Thomas nodded and didn't ask more. Where are you staying now? Bessie took off her headphones and didn't answer. She was indifferent and alienated. It seemed like David hadn't told Thomas of the incident. Thomas looked at the time and frowned lightly. You're a girl, forget it. I have something to do now, I'll talk to you later. When Bessie left, the young people who had been with Thomas came over. Thomas, was that your sister? She looks much better than the prettiest girl in our school. I heard she can play the violin. Do you want the two tickets she gave you? If not, you can give them to me. One boy stared after Bessie. Thomas glanced at him lightly. No, don't hit on her. He didn't say more. The person touched his nose and stopped talking. Thomas watched as Bessie walked away and then glanced over in the direction she had come from. The roads of Northwestern University's campus extended in all directions, but almost every road led to a different place. He pointed to the road where Bessie came from and asked the person beside him, Where does this road lead to? The medical department, the person said as he looked in the direction Thomas was pointing. My girlfriend is from the medical department. Thomas nodded and fell into deep thought. Medical department? Why did Bessie go there? Did she know someone from Northwestern University? Thomas didn't understand. After Bessie left Northwestern University, she returned the way she came. A red sports car sat parked opposite the traffic lights with the license plate 666-666 hanging arrogantly on it. The Buick behind it simply wished to be a hundred meters away from it. Once the green light was lit, the person in the driver's seat had his Bluetooth headset on and stepped on the accelerator. 
He swept his eyes across the road and saw a thin figure in the flow of people beside him. What the hell? The person on the other end of the phone call paused and then said, Samuel, say that again. No, Michael, you definitely can't guess who I just saw. Samuel parked the car to the side. I'll talk to you later, I'm stopping the car. There were sidewalks all around, but Samuel didn't find a parking space and just parked the car directly on the side. Then he pushed the door open and got out. He went into the crowd and dragged the figure aside before pulling off her hood. Bessie, didn't you go back to see your relatives in Fairfield? Bessie raised her head calmly and pulled her hood away. I never said my relatives were in Fairfield. She was straightforward. You've won. Samuel snorted, but since he was in a good mood, he accepted the reason forcefully. It was almost lunch, so he said, Let's go, I'll bring you to meet my friends. He brought Bessie into the car. He made several calls on the way. They drove to a place. Inside, they entered a private room. Let me introduce you to my friend. Samuel wore his earphones and raised an eyebrow in pride. It's a new friend, I met her in Chicago. She's a high school student. The room was silent and wasn't the kind they usually went to. Samuel didn't dare to bring Bessie to a bar. It's just a few people. He took the menu and handed it to Bessie for her to look at. I've played with them since I was young. Marvin is here as well. There's also Robert, Uncle Soup's nephew. He's being trampled on in the company, so there's no need to be ill at ease around him. He told them to come about 12, but nobody was there, so Samuel frowned. At noon, the door opened and a man in a black trench coat walked in. Samuel sat upright. They're here. But there was nobody else behind the man. After he came in, he closed the door behind him and explained. On the way here, Marvin said today was the test for 129, so they all went to Sherry's. Episode 115, A Surprise Guest Samuel tilted his head and placed his arm on the armrest. He smiled casually. When he heard those words, the smile on his lips froze slightly and his eyes narrowed. They all went there? Samuel was not in the same tune as them usually. They heard that his new friend was from Chicago and was still a high school student. Sherry went to a written test this time, and there was a dinner party to celebrate her at noon. Samuel's matter was simply not worth mentioning. It was normal not to come. The man nodded and didn't say more. He turned to Bessie and said politely, Bessie, right? Hello, I'm Robert Soup. You can just call me Robert. He looked elegant and gentle. His nose bridge was high and his voice was calm when he spoke. He looked at Bessie. He wore a white sweater and had a good-looking face. Even his half-squinted eyes were beautiful. But it was cold. He was clearly in a proper posture, but inexplicably, there was a sense of unspeakable banditry about him. Samuel turned to look at Bessie and lifted his chin at him. I've mentioned him to you before. He's Robert. Bessie's hand paused on the table when she heard this name. She looked up at Robert calmly and said politely, Hello. Daniel's old enemy. She had even sent this person's information to Daniel. Samuel asked the server to bring the dishes. Marvin called him and Samuel directly hung up, his expression dull. The steak here is very delicious. Samuel pushed the dish to Bessie and instructed her to try it. Then he asked, You came back yesterday? Where are you staying? Bessie told him the address and Samuel noted it down. The fish is excellent, too. Eat more. Robert wasn't hungry and put the fish in front of him in a unique position. On the other side, several people were waiting in another room. Marvin called Samuel with his phone, but Samuel refused to pick up. He only knew that the person who Samuel was talking about was Bessie when he arrived in the room. Why didn't you tell me it was Bessie? Marvin turned and glanced at the surrounding people. Isn't it just a little girl that Samuel knows? Why are you so nervous? A man with blonde hair said as he casually poured himself a glass of wine. Do you know how many people he has in a year? Your idol isn't easy to make an appointment with, and today's a feast made in advance. Another person nodded and said, We can just make another appointment some other day for him to bring his friend over. Otherwise, why don't we call Samuel and ask him to bring the girl along? Someone pressed down on Marvin's shoulder and forced him to sit. 
They removed his phone from his pocket and wanted to ask Samuel to bring his friend over, but the call didn't get through. Samuel didn't pick it up. The people were originally in good moods. They put down their matters at hand and the bustling room gradually became silent. Marvin stood up again, took out his phone and turned his head. Continue playing, I'll go find Samuel. He was always expressionless, but his face seemed even colder today. When he left, the people in the room exchanged glances. After a while, someone said, His reaction is a little strange. Isn't Sherry his idol? Should we find Samuel? It's just a high school student. What's the big deal? Samuel wouldn't be so petty. The blonde man withdrew his gaze and put his wine glass back on the table absentmindedly. The others considered it and also seemed to think it wasn't a big deal. When Marvin found Samuel's room, Bessie and the rest had almost finished their meal. Samuel looked up at Marvin, crossed his arms and lifted his chin. Why, aren't you meeting your goddess? Marvin touched his nose. I didn't know that Bessie came. After a pause, he couldn't help but ask. Bessie, didn't you return home to visit your relatives? She only said she was visiting her relatives, not that she was returning to Fairfield. Are you dumb? Samuel looked at Marvin mockingly. Bessie glanced at Samuel without expression. Marvin nodded. He glanced at Bessie. He didn't expect her to have relatives in Evanston. At the mention of Fairfield, Robert narrowed his eyes slightly. He put down his fork and breathed. Fairfield is good. I heard there was a very famous doctor there. Robert, you're too much. Samuel stood up and couldn't help but kick him on the leg. Have you gone crazy trying to catch Daniel? How could you ask Bessie about him? You can't even catch him. How could she have seen him before? Robert stood up and sighed. Sorry, it's a habit. Samuel picked up the car key and lowered his head. Bessie, I'll send you back to the hotel first. Bessie responded slowly. She stood up, pulled her hood over her head, and covered half of her face with it. It's very near. I'll go back myself. Samuel and the other two men were too worried about letting her go back alone. Where are you staying, Bessie? Marvin followed them. Samuel said the hotel's name. Marvin nodded. What a coincidence. Is where the banquet is being held tonight. I heard there was a banquet tonight at the hotel. Bessie squinted and strolled towards the door. Robert reached out and buttoned his trench coat before asking Bessie in a gentlemanly tone. The hotel food is good. Do you want to eat something tonight? I can send an invitation to you. If not, I could send you a portion of the food. They got off the elevator. It was windy outside. Bessie pulled her collar up and said in a muffled voice, Thanks, but there's no need. The three of them sent Bessie back to her hotel room. 2819. Samuel instructed Bessie not to open the door for just anyone. He waited for the door to close. Marvin turned around and said, How long does Bessie have to work part-time for her to stay here? He was a little worried. Samuel took out his card and told Marvin to help Bessie pay for the room. Robert thought about Fairfield and knew that Bessie's family background was probably not very good. He withdrew Samuel's card and gave it to Marvin. There's no password. Marvin took it without saying a word. He didn't dare to say that he also wanted to stay a few days. After Marvin got off the elevator, Robert pressed the button for the ground floor. How is she? Samuel raised an eyebrow. He touched his earrings and asked Robert frivolously. Robert nodded and took out a cigarette. Not bad, and her personality is good, too. It's rare. She's better than Kenny at math. Do you even know how perverted the White family is? The elevator stopped at the parking lot. Samuel couldn't help but boast as he took out his car key. But I heard her studies aren't good. Robert asked with concern. Samuel put his hand on the door of the car but didn't enter. He narrowed his eyes. She didn't take the physics exam, but her total score is 646. Besides, where did you hear about Bessie? It seems like it'll be easy to enter Northwestern University. Robert didn't mention the matter and changed the topic. Say, Robert thought for a moment and blocked the car so he couldn't close the door. Do you think Michael will help me again if I get her to beg him? Samuel looked at him as if he had gone crazy trying to catch Daniel. In the evening, Elise came to the hotel with Anne to find Grace. 
The car was parked in the parking lot, and there were several luxury cars around. It was obvious by the license plate that they couldn't be provoked. The hotel security told them politely that they couldn't leave the main entrance for the time being. Elise nodded in understanding. Then, she turned to explain to Anne, Someone is probably having a large banquet here, and they reserved the main entrance for the guests. It's difficult to have a banquet here. The side door wasn't far from the main door. Anne saw a long red carpet spread not far away, with black-clothed bodyguards lined up on both sides. It was very grand. What banquet is this? The cars parked out there look expensive. Anne said, staring at the impressive view. I'm not sure, but there are only a few families who can book this place. Elise narrowed her eyes. There are many people in the capital who would rack their brains to enter such a banquet. Anne gasped a little. Even Elise didn't know what kind of banquet this was, so she had never been in this circle before. She followed behind Elise to gate two and couldn't help but look back again. She thought about what the families attending such an event were like. One of the elevators was blocked off and security guards and bodyguards were watching the entire process and making sure the protection was airtight. Anne withdrew her gaze and seemed to see a familiar figure among a bunch of people. The man was tall. From the back, it looked a little like Kenneth. She paused. What's wrong? Elise saw Anne didn't catch up and glanced at her. Anne narrowed her eyes and looked over again. The group of people disappeared at the end of the corridor. I thought I saw my classmate. Anne bit her lip, uncertain. Your classmate? That's unlikely. Elise glanced in the same direction. Then she smiled and shook her head. The people who can go in are extremely wealthy. Who is your classmate? If it's someone from the Grant family, I might believe it. Anne looked away and also thought it was impossible. I must have seen wrongly. After thinking for a while, she took out her phone and sent a message to Kenneth. Which hotel are you staying at? She received a message from Kenneth when she reached the 58th floor. I'm staying in my relative's house. The 28th floor. Bessie sat at the table and poured the contents of her backpack onto the table. Everything was still there, except for the bottle of water she had packed into her bag. Her mobile phone lit up. It was Daniel asking for a video call, and Bessie directly answered. It's abnormal. Daniel had just taken a shower and his hair was still wet. He walked to the living room with his phone and opened a can of beer. Bessie, it wasn't the hacker league that helped me conceal my information. Bessie was too lazy to scold him. She just put the other things back into her bag, except for the foreign book, and started flipping through it. Oh, it wasn't Chief Matthew either, so who do you think it was? Daniel took a sip of beer and said without waiting for her to reply, Forget it, there's no use asking you. Didn't I tell you last time that Matthew had your name on the list and someone was investigating you? I told him to come over, and I looked at it during the day but I couldn't find anything. I'll send it to you later. Bessie raised an eyebrow and said frivolously, Send it to me. Who dared to investigate her? It must be because you didn't do a clean job when you were investigating. I won't let you help me investigate in the future. Daniel put down his beer and continued. Robert is a lunatic. I can't let him catch you. Someone rang the doorbell. Bessie could faintly hear Samuel talking to Robert. Someone's at the door. I'm hanging up. Bessie hung up directly. Then she opened the door. I brought food for you. Samuel stood in front of Robert, carrying a bag in his hand. Behind him were Marvin and a man who was about as tall as him. The four people made Bessie's room appear small when they came in. Samuel put the bag of food on the table and glanced around the room, unimpressed. This is Patrick. Samuel pointed to the man beside Marvin. Patrick took a step forward and said, Hello, Bessie. Marvin skillfully arranged the dishes and then picked up the pot in the room to boil water and make tea for Bessie. Patrick and Robert saw this for the first time and were shocked. Samuel was accustomed to it, however, so he sat down and asked, Bessie, have you met your relative? Where is he? What does he do? The capital is our place. You can tell him to find me if he has any trouble. Marvin poured tea for Bessie and glanced over curiously. 
she definitely wouldn't contact the Smith family, so she still had other relatives in Evanston? Did she have a family member working here? Bessie thanked Marvin and then sat down and picked up her fork. She said vaguely, He's a showman. I'm going to find him tomorrow. Marvin and the others nodded, understanding her. It's hard work, Robert said with a good temper, his voice soft. You can tell him to follow me. I just don't have sufficient staff. They were talking when the doorbell rang again. Marvin put down the pot and opened the door. When he saw the person standing outside, Marvin felt like he had time-traveled for a moment. Mr. Mr. Grint? Episode 116 Is he related to Mr. Grint? Mr. Grint paused. He didn't expect a man to open the door. He took a step back and glanced at the room number. It was 2819. Mr. Grint put his hands behind his back and asked Brian, Did you tell me the wrong room number? Brian glanced at him lightly as if he was staring at a fool and didn't speak or move. Marvin, who still had his hand on the door handle, returned to his senses and asked, uncertain, Mr. Grint, who are you looking for? Samuel and Robert had just returned and had informed no one, so Mr. Grint shouldn't know they were here. Mr. Grint had no business with them. He thought for a moment and asked politely, Excuse me, does Bessie stay here? Marvin expected the answer, but he still nodded in shock. Mr. Grint smiled and seemed to sigh in relief. Then yes, I came to find her. He glanced at the room that seemed to have several people inside and didn't go in. Marvin didn't close the door and just returned to the group with a blank face. Bessie was still eating while facing the glass window. She had one hand resting on the table and her head tilted as if listening to Samuel. Who was outside? Samuel thought the server arrived to deliver dinner, but Marvin came back empty-handed. Oh, it's Mr. Grint. Marvin looked at Bessie and said faintly, Bessie, he's looking for you. Bessie's hand paused when she heard this. She put down her fork and looked at Marvin calmly. I know. Then she stood up and excused herself politely to Samuel and the others. She reached out to pull on the collar of her sweater and walked outside before closing the door. After she left, Robert tilted his head curiously. Marvin, which Mr. Grint are you talking about? There were quite a few people with the last name Grint in Evanston, but there was only one man who they considered to be a mister. Robert subconsciously removed the Grint family from the list of Bessie's acquaintances. Samuel also leaned back and raised an eyebrow, but he knew his limits and didn't follow her. Is that her relative? Yeah, Marvin nodded and replied. It is Rupert Grint, the music teacher of Palace Level. I bought his tickets for chairperson soup before. Oh, Samuel nodded at Robert. They said nothing. Samuel moved back calmly. After a minute, the two of them reacted. Samuel stared at Marvin expressionlessly. Who did you just say was here? Mr. Grint, Marvin said. I've seen him at the banquet dinner. Wasn't her relative a musician? Robert put his phone down and almost collapsed. Marvin nodded and stood beside Patrick. He reminded him considerately. The one you said could follow you in the future. Robert was speechless. The entire corridor of the hotel was lined with carpet. It was silent. Mr. Grint, long time no see. Bessie stood at the end of the corridor with her eyes downcast. She said rather impatiently, Didn't I say I would find you tomorrow? Why did you come here first? She had specifically not told him the name of the hotel. It was on the way. There's a banquet at this hotel and I thought you were staying here, so I came to see you on the way. Mr. Grint spoke calmly. Beside him, Brian crossed his arms and leaned against the wall of the corridor. He raised an eyebrow when he heard this. Someone hadn't slept a wink last night and he had nagged to bring him to see Bessie. Is your hand okay? Mr. Grint looked at her right hand and twitched an eyebrow with worry. Bessie raised her right hand. There was a shallow pink scar on it, and it was pretty long. There were also the mark of stitches running the length of it. It was fine long ago. Bessie looked down and relaxed her expression. It was worth it. Bullshit. I already heard from Brian. Which bastard is worth exchanging your hand for? Brian had been so elegant for years. It was the first time Mr. Grint cursed with a red face. 
He thought for a while before gesturing with his thumb. He's only worth this little. Bessie coughed, then cleared her throat and changed the topic. Mr. Grint, about the learning. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry at all. Mr. Grint waved his hand quickly and calmly. You can finish watching the concert tomorrow night and then decide if you want to continue learning. I only came to see you on the way today. Okay. Bessie squinted and laughed softly. Then we'll talk about it tomorrow night. Mr. Grint observed Bessie's expression and thought she seemed a little absent-minded. She looked frivolous and undisciplined, but she hid her emotions well, and Mr. Grint couldn't tell what she was thinking. Okay. Mr. Grint put his hands behind his back. He turned and wanted to bring Brian away, but he remembered something suddenly and turned around again. Oh yes, I thought the person who opened your door just now was pretty familiar. It's my friend. Bessie lowered her eyebrows calmly. Mr. Grint nodded and said a few more words to Bessie before taking Brian downstairs. Bessie sent the two of them to the elevator and then returned to her room. The four people in the room gazed at her. Bessie sat quietly on the chair, picked up her fork and continued to eat. Her eyebrows drooped and she seemed rather serious. Now, why was Mr. Grint looking for you? Samuel sat the bottle of mineral water in his hand on the table. Beside him, the other three people also didn't understand it. Why did a music teacher come personally to find Bessie? Bessie glanced at him lazily. Something happened. Samuel nodded without asking further, but he still said, I didn't know the musician you were talking about was Mr. Grint. Robert, Marvin, and Patrick all stared at Bessie. The next day, in the evening at Evanston's performance hall, Anne wasn't the major performer, she was a solo and only went up to play for an ensemble. There was another boy in front of her. This opportunity was extremely rare. After all, all the musicians were present and were being observed by the conductor, Mr. Grint. People who wanted this opportunity were a dime a dozen. The organizer only chose Anne and the other boy after listening to all the tapes everyone had sent in. He had placed Anne behind the boy, which showed Anne's importance. Therefore, Elise and the Perez family thought that the result would be as they expected. Anne and Elise stood at the ticket gate, waiting for Thomas and Grace. Thomas came with a classmate and Grace arrived before him. He greeted Grace and the others politely, but frowned when he didn't see Bessie. Aunt, didn't Bessie come? Thomas asked in a low voice. It thrilled Elise to see Thomas and his classmate, but her smile faded slightly when she heard that. She didn't come. Let's go in first. Anne was pleasantly surprised. Thomas mentioned he would come last time, but he never showed. She didn't expect him to come this time either. Brother, where's Mr. Grint? He's busy. Thomas raised an eyebrow, pursed his lips slightly, and glanced at Grace. Grace, do you have any other relatives in Evanston? Grace shook her head. No. Thomas squeezed his fingers. He frowned slightly. So... Bessie was alone in Evanston? He had called her last night, but she didn't tell him where she was staying. But it seemed like Grace knew nothing. Thomas furled his eyebrows and wanted to call Bessie, but he had already come to the concert and it was rude not to watch it. Besides, he brought a classmate along. Thomas entered the venue patiently. Only Kenneth remained. Mom, go ahead with Elise. There's still a classmate left. You don't have to greet him. Anne hugged her violin and smiled at them. Elise knew a classmate from Chicago. She reached out to wrap her shawl around her with little interest and nodded. Then I'll go in first. Before she could turn around, Anne froze suddenly. Mom, isn't that Bessie? She pointed to two people not far away. Grace was about to head in with Elise. Hearing this, she turned and looked at the two young people standing by the door not far away. One of them was wearing a sweater with a hood pulled up over her head. Although half of her face was covered, it was clear who she was, and her standing posture was a little unruly and casual. Elise looked up and said mockingly, Wasn't she not coming? She glanced over and saw a boy in a black jacket beside her, his fresh and handsome face obvious. He seemed to be in a good mood. Elise narrowed her eyes and pointed in their direction. Do you know the guy? Brian was notorious, and everyone knew him. He told once that her violin playing was unpleasant, 
So Anne answered, Yeah, it's Brian Jake. He's Mr. Grint's grandson. Elise grabbed her shawl tighter and asked in a high-pitched voice, He's Mr. Grint's grandson? Episode 117 The Sound of Anne's Violin Normally, almost everyone associated the surname Grint with Mr. Grint specifically. Anne was stunned after hearing this from Elise. Brian's mother's maiden name was indeed Grint, but he's a notorious little bully in our school. Anne looked away and glanced at Elise. He's always fighting, and everyone in our school is afraid of him. How could such a person be related to Mr. Grint? Really? Elise paused. His temperament did not seem like that of a bully. Anne did not want Elise to pay too much attention to Bessie, so she explained. He's just a school bully. He previously attended Baybridge High School. The group of students there did so many bad things. Now he's in Brightbow High School sports class. Elise nodded and finally withdrew her gaze. But mom, shouldn't Bessie be in school now? Anne sorted out the two tickets and turned her head, unable to understand. Why is she here with Brian? Elise sneered again. Grace pursed her lips. She had wanted to go over and ask Bessie what was going on, but when she heard this, she stopped in her tracks. The two of them went inside. Only then did Anne glance in Bessie's direction with a slight frown on her face. Before long, Kenneth also arrived. I had some matters. Kenneth wore a black baseball jacket and a black mask that showed only his cold eyes. Sorry for the wait. Anne hugged her violin and said it was fine. The two of them went inside. Anne glanced towards the small door again. But Bessie and Brian had disappeared. She thought it was a little strange. Kenneth went to take a seat beside Grace, his mask making him difficult to recognize. But Grace recognized him and nodded at him. When he saw her, Kenneth paused and then greeted her. Mrs. Smith. There was a rare respect in his tone. Grace was a little stunned. Anne had told her more than once that Kenneth was the unmovable first place in school. So he impressed her. He was a little arrogant and rarely talked much. But why was his attitude so good today? Kenneth was respectful to Grace, but he only greeted Elise casually. Elise glanced at him lightly and did not reply. After a while, the phone in Kenneth's pocket rang, and he reached out to pull his mask down. I'm going to the bathroom. Anne stood up and wanted to tell him that the bathroom backstage was off limits and he had to go to the lobby, but Kenneth had already left. Anne wasn't particularly concerned about him, so she just sat back down and thought nothing of it. Bessie and Brian went directly backstage where there was a small door for the staff to use. Brian was familiar with the place. When the two went in, several expert musicians were warming up backstage. I heard from the organizers that there's a solo performance and the newbie is pretty good. A middle-aged man said he was Bennett Anderson, second only to Mr. Grint. It wasn't easy to climb up to this position, especially in such a large-scale high-end music concert. The others nodded. It's a girl. Her aptitude and spirituality are good, but she's here specifically for Mr. Grint. Who isn't here for Mr. Grint? Someone laughed. Bennett stood by the side in silence, his expression cold. He was younger than Mr. Grint, and his family achievements were just as impressive. It was only in this industry that he was second to Mr. Grint. Sensing the strange atmosphere, the others closed their mouths and dared not to say anything. Brian, are you here to find your grandpa? Brian brought Bessie in during a pause, and a few teachers pointed out their direction of him. He's tuning his violin inside there. Thanks, Brian smiled. The others waved their hands and then glanced at the girl beside him. The girl was unfamiliar, and judging by her casual dress, she did not seem to be a competitor that night. Could she be Brian's girlfriend? Everyone in the circle knew that someone had kidnapped Mr. Grint's grandson when he was a kid. He was mischievous, and they said that he stayed in the country and wasn't willing to go to Evanston to study. Mr. Grint heard their voices and came out with his violin. Bessie, you're here. Mr. Grint's face glowed, and he seemed thrilled. Come in. He turned and allowed the two of them to enter the lounge. 
Judging by his attitude, he was much better towards the girl than to Brian. Mr. Grint, this is... Someone smiled at Bessie. There had been rumors that Mr. Grint had a favorite girl student, but some people did not believe it. This was because Mr. Grint had never had an apprentice who was a girl, even after such a long time. If he had a favorite student, the status of such an apprentice was definitely above that of a common violinist. So why wouldn't he bring her out to boast? My juniors came to watch my performance. Mr. Grint's voice was gentle, unhurried, and emotionless. The others did not doubt him. Inside, Mr. Grint opened the surveillance screens to view the stage and the auditorium. How's this performance hall? Mr. Grint stood in the middle of the room and pointed at the glorious performance hall on the TV screen. The industry recognizes anyone who can board this performance stage. This performance hall used to be a royal residence, and the requirements to perform here were extremely strict. The goal of every musician was to have a personal concert here. Bessie dragged a chair over and held the backrest with one hand and a cup in her other. Her long eyelashes drooped slightly in an unruly and casual manner around her squinted eyes. She looked lazily at the TV screen as if Mr. Grint's surging passion did not move her. Brian sat halfway on the table with his head lowered and seemed to send a message to someone. Mr. Grint paused and then extended his right hand to smack Brian's head fiercefully. Why on earth are you here? Are you sure you're here to watch my performance? Brian was speechless. Yeah? Brian looked up at his grandfather. He held his mobile phone and sighed. I was wrong. I should watch your performance seriously and religiously. He lowered his head at the confession. Oh, Bessie. Brian put his phone back in his pocket. Then he stood up, held out Mr. Grint's violin to her, and squinted his pair of phoenix eyes. Try it? Bessie looked at the violin in his hands for a moment, her expression still casual and unruly. After a long while, she finally put the cup on the table and took the violin. Then, she lowered her head and closed her eyes slightly. Familiar with the place, Kenneth quickly arrived backstage. He pulled down his mask. Bennett came out and was shocked to see him. Kenny! The White family was prestigious and Eric White's name was well known in the capital. Everyone in the circle knew clearly in their hearts who could and couldn't be provoked in Evanston. Mr. Anderson. Kenneth liked the violin, so the people here would reserve a ticket for him every time there was a large-scale performance. The Anderson family had some interactions with the White family. Bennett wanted to talk more to Kenneth, but his performance was coming up so he did not stay long and went to the waiting area in advance. Kenneth did not enter the bathroom and just made a phone call in the corridor. After the phone call, he heard the faint sound of a violin coming from the lounge when he was about to leave. The outer cord was clanging, while the inner cord was gentle and low. The cords rose and fell, cutting open his heart and hitting his soul directly. This kind of music was like a fulfilling pageant in one's heart. It could draw people in and fully immerse them within a few moments. Kenneth was still holding on to his mask as his gaze wandered to the lounge. Not long after, the door at the end of the corridor opened, and the people from the music group rushed in. Hurry, Mr. Anderson is waiting for us. Don't forget your instruments. The opening performance was an entire ensemble. There were almost a hundred people in the music group. Their noisy footsteps disturbed Kenneth's thoughts. He stood there looking at the lounge for a long time, recognizing it as Mr. Grint's room. After thinking for a while, he left. If he remembered correctly, there was a camera monitoring backstage. Kenneth returned to his seat. Anne was a little surprised. The bathroom was outside and it would take at least 15 minutes to return, but Kenneth arrived in less than 10 minutes. However, the performance was starting, so Anne kept quiet. Their seats were in the middle, and there were four rows of individual VIP seats in front of them, which were reserved for some nobles and masters who were going to perform solo. The lights above their heads lowered instantaneously, and the performance began. Apart from some cultural snobs, those who came to watch the concert were mostly knowledgeable people in the industry. The solo performances were by experts, 
so even those cultural snobs felt goosebumps all over their bodies when they heard their music. They experienced the five flavors of life through the music. This was especially so during Mr. Grint's last performance. He showed all the greatest skills he gained throughout his life, be it changing handles, playing on double strings, harmonics, or jumping strings, he played smoothly and reached perfection. These skills could not be achieved by raw talent only. They were obtained through rigorous perseverance with practice. Everyone knew Mr. Grint was the master of the violin and it wasn't groundless. His rigor and reverence for the violin were beyond everyone's imagination. Over the years, he had never made a single mistake in any of his thousands of performances. Only real violin masters understood his greatness. A conductor and an ordinary expert were worlds apart. After Mr. Grint played for 20 minutes and pulled the last string, the audience fell silent for an entire minute before the tide-like applause sounded. Bessie sat on the far left of the first row. After listening, she rubbed her face and took a deep breath. The two teachers sitting next to her were discussing amongst themselves. Mr. Grint's performance tonight compared to his pinnacle performance in Australia. After listening to him, I feel like I might as well go home and become a farmer. Everyone left after the show. Bessie pulled her sweater's hood over her head and left through another passageway. There are two new students whom the organizer pushed in. Brian followed Bessie and whispered, Let's wait. Okay. Bessie lowered her head slightly, so deep in thoughts that her reaction was slow. The two of them went out of the small door. Almost everyone had left the performance hall. Grace and Elise stayed, along with the other boy's family. Look, Anne is going on stage to play soon. Grace directly sent a video to Andrea, her tone suppressed with excitement. Hearing this, Susan, who had been doing her homework, couldn't help but look over. She had been sulking these few days, so Pete and Andrea did not talk to her. The video was not a dress rehearsal like last time. It was at the concert site. Be it the lighting or the special effects, it was way beyond that of the last dress rehearsal. The stage is so beautiful, Susan could not help but gasp. She paused and then asked, Grace, is Anne going on stage? Soon, once the boy finishes playing, it'll be Anne's turn. Grace had always been proud of Anne. Now that she finally had the chance, she could not restrain from boasting. Grace took out a mirror, reapplied her lipstick, and glanced over at them with the corner of her eye in disdain. It was as if they had never seen the world. The first one on stage was the boy, the organizers selected him, so his qualifications were good. He was about 15 or 16 years old and was very young. Unfortunately, his spirituality was not as impressive as his skills. However, it was obvious that he was a top-notch seedling. The group of teachers all praised him, but Mr. Grint sat on his chair and held his cup calmly. His performance did not impress him much, and he only commented, He's all right. However, getting any word of praise from Mr. Grint meant the boy was indeed good. The teachers understood this. The next one is a girl named Anne. The teacher had done her homework. The organizer recommended her and insisted Mr. Grint would surely like her. Her last name was Miller as well. And she thought he would like her? Mr. Grint raised an eyebrow and felt a little more curious. Anne went on stage holding her violin. Within 10 seconds, Mr. Grint seemed to hear something. He slammed the cup on the table and stared coldly at Anne. Episode 118, A Familiar Sound Bessie's style was extremely strong. Her spirituality and talent were both rare to Mr. Grint. Otherwise, he wouldn't be so interested in her even after being explicitly rejected so many times. Brian lived upstairs from Bertha's apartment, and when Mr. Grint first heard Bessie play the violin, she was only seven years old. She was still young, but had sat alone on the old balcony, her dark eyes reflecting a sense of impenetrable loneliness. That was the first time Mr. Grint realized some people could play the violin and shake people's hearts without having skills. 
She had an extraordinary imagination in the way she arranged music. Brian told him that day that her parents had divorced. Bessie had a violin teacher, and he was her life mentor. Mr. Grint knew that, so he didn't see someone else's favorite student. However, one day, Brian called him to say that Bessie had separated from her teacher. Mr. Grint hurried over from the Capitol to see her immediately. But Bessie seemed very repulsed by Evanston. Bertha was very polite to him and even brought him to see Bessie in her room. He saw many crumpled music sheets in Bessie's trash can. In the first ten seconds of Anne's arrangement, he didn't hear it. But after ten seconds, the music changed to a rhythmically undulated tempo. It wasn't a lively tempo and was the kind that oppressed and stirred up people's hearts. Mr. Grint's sensitivity to music was terrifying. He remembered the song that Bessie had played on her birthday three years ago. It had a bit of irritability, depression, and an unpredictable sense of deep grief. Everyone had their style of playing, and Bessie's style couldn't be easily replicated. Mr. Grint put his fingers on the table and looked at Anne without expression. She played for five minutes, and several sections interspersed with a rhythm that Mr. Grint was very familiar with. It added up to three minutes of her performance. Those three minutes also were the highlight of Anne's performance. Below the stage, Thomas immediately stood up and walked outside after Anne's performance. His classmate called him from behind. Thomas, your sister is outstanding. I felt goosebumps in several paragraphs in the middle. She's no less than those experts. Thomas responded coldly and wore an expressionless look on his handsome face. Didn't your sister say she has to apply for an apprenticeship? Aren't you waiting for the result? His classmate glanced back and was reluctant. I'm not waiting. I'm finding Bessie. Thomas frowned lightly and took out his phone to call her. Thomas seemed to mention Bessie's name often. His classmate smirked and reached over his shoulder. Speaking of this, your sister Bessie looks much better than your sister. She's in the ninth grade this year, right? Then she can come to our school next year. She can't come. Thomas smiled lightly when he heard this, but like the ripples of an icy lake, his smile soon disappeared. Her grades are too bad. The classmate froze for a while and then laughed. That's a pity. Kenneth stood up after Anne's performance. After thinking for a while, he lowered his head slightly, said something to Grace, and then went backstage with his mask on. Grace was too nervous about the result and didn't have time to pay attention to Kenneth. She just turned her head, deliberately lowered her voice, and asked Elise, What did the teacher in the front say about Anne's performance? Elise didn't speak, but Grandpa Perez stood up while supporting himself on the handrails. He looked at Grace and laughed aloud. Anne's performance was excellent, and her quality was much better than usual. Come, let's go in front and watch. Elise looked at Grace and also said in a rare, friendly tone, don't worry, but the music host also said that Mr. Grint would surely like her. Grace relaxed after hearing Elise's words. She stood up and straightened her clothes before following Grandpa Perez and Elise. After the performance, everyone remained silent for a couple of minutes and nobody responded. They were showing respect to Mr. Grint. Mr. Grint just leaned back in his chair and stared at Anne with a pair of slightly muddled eyes, as if trying to figure her out. After a while, a teacher looked at Mr. Grint and asked carefully, Mr. Grint, what did you think of her? Any information on her? Let me look, Mr. Grint said lightly, and he clasped his fingers on the table. It could be a coincidence if only one or two segments were similar, but within the five-minute tune, he had heard three minutes of similarity, so it wasn't just a coincidence. Mr. Grint remembered that someone had told him that these two students would perform their original songs. Someone immediately handed the information to Mr. Grint. Mr. Grint took it and flipped through it slowly. He was so nervous that someone at the side whispered, Mr. Grint is looking at it so seriously, it seems like he has intentions of accepting her as an apprentice. That girl is here for Mr. Grint. Bennett stood to the side with a solemn expression on his face. He was very interested in Anne. Now that the violin industry was divided into so many groups, Bennett couldn't compare with Mr. Grint. 
so he didn't want to be suppressed by him on the matter of finding a successor and an apprentice as well. Anne's tune had amazed him. Although she was unskilled in the middle, the repertoire was spiritual enough to add points to her performance. Mr. Grint was unaware of the discussions going on around him and only focused on the information in his hands. Her field contained her resume as well as her grade in violin and the medals she had won in her youth. These were all for show, so Mr. Grint breezed through it lightly. Finally, his fingertips stopped on a line that read, The repertoire in this performance is original. Anne. Mr. Grint casually put down the material and looked lightly at the girl. Did you say that this track is your original? Anne's hands tightened when she heard this. Two nights ago, she had spent almost the whole evening listening to Noah Hyber's old music. There was indeed a track in Noah Hyber's early album that resembled this track's style. But even though the style was similar, the arrangement was completely different. She looked up and said politely and confidently, Yes. Mr. Grint nodded and asked again, When? I started in September, Anne replied in a matter-of-fact and natural tone. I practiced it many times in school and all my classmates know. After getting this answer, Mr. Grint didn't say a single word. He just stood up from the table and picked up his thermos again, before nodding at the other teachers. Everyone, I have matters to attend to first. Everyone present, including Bennett, thought that Mr. Grint was interested in Anne as an apprentice after asking such meticulous questions. Who knew that he would leave with his cup and say anything? Grandpa Perez, Elise, and Grace arrived at that moment. They were all stunned when they saw this. Mr. Grint, what do you mean? Don't you want Anne? Bennett stood up directly and asked with bright eyes. Mr. Grint held his teacup and his movements towards Bennett weren't difficult to understand. His reaction had been about the same when he first heard Bessie play the violin. No, I don't want her. Mr. Grint's voice was faint and emotionless. Anne, who had thought that the victory was in her palms, looked up in disbelief. She was very confident in her piece since both Kenneth and Grandpa Perez had praised it in the past few months, so she had bet her future on it. Mr. Grint gave her an unexpected blow. How could he say no so coldly? The other teachers didn't understand. The boy hadn't been as spiritual as Anne, and Mr. Grint had even said he was all right. You don't want her? Bennett was unexpectedly surprised, but he deliberately suppressed his surprise and asked again. Yes. Mr. Grint continued to walk towards the exit without looking back. Bennett heaved a sigh of relief. Other than Mr. Grint, nobody else would contest for Anne with him, so he said with a smile, Mr. Grint is indeed a master. He can't take a fancy to Anne. I wonder what kind of prodigy he would take a fancy to he was mocking him. Many people came for apprenticeships yearly, and this was the first time Bennett had seen such a spiritual student as Anne. Who knew that Mr. Grint would pause, turn, and say with an unpredictability, You guessed correctly. He seemed to think of something and was in a better mood instantly. He turned around and walked away quickly. Anne clenched her hands and pursed her lips at the rejection. Mr. Grint, was it because my original track wasn't good enough? There are some sections of the track that you played that I particularly like, because they were indeed spiritual, Mr. Grint said, but he originally wanted to ignore Anne. Bessie's repertoire always came and went, so he wasn't sure if she had an original manuscript, but it had never been published before. With no actual proof, the person who plagiarized it would surely be confident and unafraid. Mr. Grint thought about this indifferently, and his face sank. Anne didn't see this and continued to ask with a firm voice, Then why don't you want me? Why? He turned around, stared at Anne, and his smile disappeared. Because I've heard a similar track before. You said this is your original track. Okay, so I asked you when you had composed it, and you said you composed it in September this year. Anne, you're pretty impressive. How did you bring back someone else's original track from three years ago to this year's September? After saying his piece, Mr. Grint thought it was meaningless, so he directly walked to the gate with a solemn face. 
Everyone else, including Bennett and the Perez family, was stunned and rooted to the ground. Kenneth didn't know the situation and went directly backstage. He went to find the person in charge. Kenneth was a regular visitor and attended each time there was a violin performance. The person in charge knew him. Kenny? The person in charge reacted in surprise when he heard Kenneth's request. He thought for a moment and said simply, Follow me. Kenneth took off his mask, cleared his throat and followed him. The two of them walked up the corner of the corridor. They bumped into Mr. Grint who had just come off stage. Kenneth was very respectful to Mr. Grint and stopped along with the person in charge. Mr. Grint. Oh, Kenny. Mr. Grint's expression softened slightly. Where are you going? Previously, Eric had always brought Kenneth to visit Mr. Grint because he liked the violin. I'm going to the surveillance room. Kenneth held his mask and looked at Mr. Grint. His eyes were cold. There were too many people just now and I lost something in the washroom. This thing was probably really important for Kenneth to go back to the monitor himself. Mr. Grint nodded and didn't disturb him. He was eager to find Bessie, so he said, Go ahead, there are many people, so it might not be easy to find. They bid farewell and headed in different directions. After two steps, Kenneth paused and turned around. Mr. Grint, was there anyone in your lounge today? Mr. Grint stopped at the sudden question and also asked, That thing, did you lose it in our lounge? No. Kenneth lowered his eyes and shook his head. Sorry for disturbing you. He went to the surveillance room. The staff let Kenneth look at the surveillance video from the back room of the corridor. Not this one. Kenneth didn't sit and just leaned on the table with his fingers as he watched the screen. Do you have one of the lounges? The monitor attendant paused. He looked at Kenneth in surprise. The organizer specially brought him. He even called him Kenny respectfully. The lounge was a public place and held no secrets, so the attendant moved his mouse and found a surveillance video there. Kenneth pointed directly to Mr. Grint's room and said lightly, Here, enlarge it. The staff nodded and clicked on the file before enlarging the screen. Kenneth's fingers tightened on the table as he gazed at the screen. Episode 119 Anne's new teacher. The staff showed Kenneth the surveillance of when he was in the corridor. Because the first performance was starting, the whole hall outside the lounge was full of people, but Mr. Grint's door never opened. Kenneth wasn't in a hurry, so he waited patiently and stared at the video while leaning against the table. The people in the surveillance video would eventually come out. Mr. Grint didn't return to his car immediately. Instead, he called Bertha. Bertha was still sleeping, so the nurse picked up the phone and told him she was asleep. Mr. Grint rubbed his eyebrows and was worried about Bertha's condition. Anne's unexpected performance also troubled him. Bertha's importance to Bessie was obvious. She was hospitalized early this summer and had yet to be discharged. He was still in deep thought when he got into the limousine. Inside, Brian leaned into his seat pointed at the time on his watch and asked, Grandpa, what took you so long? Bessie sat in the back row with Brian while Mr. Grint sat in the front. I bumped into Kenny. Mr. Grint lowered his head and then said, We just talked a little. Kenneth? Brian wasn't interested in him. He must be here to watch the concert. Mr. Grint looked up calmly. Yeah, he said he lost something and went to watch the surveillance videos. Brian nodded and didn't reply. Bessie narrowed her eyes. She was deep in thought. She tapped on Brian's arm with her phone and waited for him to look over before saying, Go sit in front. Brian didn't ask any questions. He exited the car and walked to the front to sit next to Mr. Grint. Once he was in front, Bessie leaned on the back and flipped open the crystal screen of her phone. She extended the phone and lit the screen. She opened the editor page. Bessie, have you ever thought of continuing to learn the violin from me? Mr. Grint leaned on the back of the chair and rested his arms on the window, while knocking on it with his fingertips irregularly. As Bessie took a book from her bag, she put the keyboard on it. She typed on the keyboard while speaking to Mr. Grint, her white and clean face slightly lowered. There was no light in the car, and only a little fluorescent light shone on her face. I don't know. I still need to think about it. 
Her hand movements were fast. The address of the Royal Performance Hall was easy to find. The surveillance route was also easy to find. After typing a string of characters, Bessie leaned back and pressed enter. She didn't pay attention to Kenneth, but had heard some stuff from Paul. He stared at the school's art building and looked many times at the surveillance videos. In the past, Bessie always rejected it at the mention of this. Bessie appeared relaxed, and it surprised Mr. Grint. Okay, think about it. You must think about it. I'll bring you two to eat at Fogo de Chao. Mr. Grint said as he sat up straight. Bessie lowered her head and slowly put her phone back. No need. Bessie looked out the window and thought for a while. Drop me off here. I'm waiting for someone. You? Mr. Grint wanted to say that she had no relatives or friends in Evanston, so who could she be waiting for? But he remembered Marvin, who had opened the door earlier and paused. Although he was reluctant, he still told the driver to stop and instructed her once again to consider his offer before she left. In the concert hall, Kenneth was still monitoring the video. He sped it up by four times. From the initial bustling crowd, the surveillance video was now empty. The attendant was bored and sat flipping casually on his phone. Kenneth waited patiently without showing a sign of impatience. The lounge door remained closed. Suddenly, the video stopped moving. The surveillance video was stuck there, and then it finally flashed and exited. What's wrong with it? Kenneth reached out and knocked on the table with one hand. He pressed his eyebrows with his other hand while suppressing his rage. The attendant put down his phone and pressed the mouse several times, but it flashed every time. He was the only person who monitored the videos and was not one of the technical staff, so he couldn't figure it out. He answered apologetically, Kenny, the surveillance file might be broken. I don't think you can view it now. Kenneth stared at the computer screen. When can you fix it? The staff member hesitated. Um, I'm not sure what's wrong with it. I might ask a professional to look. The person in charge took a step back. Can it be copied? Make a copy for him. The surveillance video shouldn't be shared arbitrarily, but in the eyes of the people in the capital, some things didn't need any rules, as they were only used to restrict ordinary people. The attendant found a USB flash drive and made a copy for Kenneth to take with him. In the music hall, the others exchanged glances after hearing Mr. Grint. Grace's proud expression froze, and she heard herself say mechanically, Anne Miller. Anne's face was pale and thunder seemed to blare in her mind and ring out frequently. She had played that track so many times, yet nobody could tell her it wasn't her original composition. But who knew that Mr. Grint would recognize it? If this matter wasn't resolved, all her future and dreams would stagnate. That included everything she now had in the Perez and Smith family. I didn't. Anne pinched her palm and tried hard to maintain her expression. I know that Mr. Grint is talking about Noah Hyber's Dark Album series from three years ago, but I've listened to it already. Although the style is very similar, the arrangement is unique. She took out her phone and played the song from Noah Hyber's Dark Album series on the spot. Several paragraphs in the song were like Anne's style, but none of the arrangements were similar. The other teachers had originally frowned and intended to ignore Anne, but after hearing this, they exchanged glances again. Mr. Grint is just too demanding, and his vision is too high, which is why he hasn't even found an apprentice till now. Bennett straightened his clothes as he spoke. I think he's too confused. This arrangement is so amazing. Since it was a tune that was heard three years ago, it's impossible to keep it silent and do nothing about it, right? Have you heard it in the past three years? The other people thought he made sense. Indeed, nobody would hide such an arrangement at home. Someone nodded and looked at Anne, his expression softening. You're very spiritual, and we can compare the dark arrangement to Noah Hyber's tune three years ago. You're still young and have unlimited potential for the future. Noah Hyber was a popular singer. Nobody in the music industry, including Bennett and this group of people, dared to look down on him because he was a genius composer. The entire music industry recognized him. Whether they were masters of the piano, violin, wind section, etc., 
They liked to pick out Noah Heiber's old music scores and then rearrange them into their music. This was a form of artistic conception, and some hyped masters even made a fortune because the song spread all over the internet. Hearing this comment, Anne's heart finally relaxed. Bennett smiled and walked towards Anne. His tone was kind when he spoke. I'm Bennett Anderson. You can call me Mr. Anderson. I wonder if you would like to learn the violin from me. Bennett's reputation wasn't as big as that of Mr. Grint's. But in this city, the Anderson family and Bennett were still famous enough. Grandpa Perez's gloomy face was now overjoyed as he took two steps forward and bowed his head. Of course, this is her honor. Anne, greet your teacher. Grandpa Perez gestured to Anne with his eyes. Anne thought that the Perez family wouldn't care about her anymore now that Mr. Grint hadn't accepted her as an apprentice so she didn't expect Grandpa Perez to be as intimate as before. She exhaled slowly, walked to Bennett, and said respectfully, Teacher. The others congratulated Bennett on finding a spiritual apprentice. They were full of envy, but they had no other choice other than Mr. Grint. None of them could surpass Bennett. And Bennett just smirked in the direction where Mr. Grint had left, his smile hiding his motive. Bessie sat on the roadside and waited for Samuel. Samuel drove over and saw that Bessie was using her phone, chatting with someone. She had her sweater hood pulled over her head. Today, she had changed into a black sweater, and although she was sitting lazily, she seemed even colder than usual. A few strands of her black hair hung out from the side as she held her phone with her long fingers. People who stopped nearby and waited couldn't help but glance at her. Samuel lowered the window and called for her. Bessie pulled off her hood and slowly stood up. A Twitter message popped up. Your arrangement has been delayed for three months. Episode 120 A New Video Message Every three months, Bessie sends an arrangement to Noah Hyber. Sometimes she added the lyrics herself, and other times he wrote them. But because of Bertha, Bessie hadn't sent an arrangement in a long time. She held her phone in her hand. While replying to him, she walked over to Samuel. It's not far. Samuel put his hands on the steering wheel and looked towards the rear seat in the rearview mirror. It's ten minutes away. Noah Hyber might have known she had matters to attend to and didn't urge her. Bessie scrolled down and saw the documents that Daniel had sent her. Marvin and the others had previously interrupted her, and she didn't have time to read it. She clicked on the file to open it. Daniel had sent a list and a simple document that wasn't very confidential. Bessie found her name on the list. She narrowed her eyes slightly. Within ten minutes, the car stopped at a clubhouse. It was downtown, but the clubhouse was extremely secluded. Samuel led her directly to the top floor. On the top floor, there were only two rooms. Each room was normal, and there were a variety of entertainment facilities. There were four service personnel standing outside the doors of each room. When Samuel approached, they smiled and made sure not to look him in the eye. There weren't many people in the room. There was a TV opposite a table, and a spacious table contained dominoes and tools used for the game Truth or Dare. There were also a bunch of strange wires running along the wall. Michael sat on the sofa with his arm on the armrest. He took off his coat and casually placed it on the table, causing the front of his black shirt to spread open. He leaned back with his eyes half-closed. A cigarette hung vicariously between his lips. He seemed quite low in spirits. Robert was playing a game with a few others quietly. Robert turned at the sound of everyone entering and piped, "'You're here?' He rose from his seat and stepped to the side to make space for Bessie and Samuel. The others also greeted Samuel and then looked at Bessie curiously. They secretly wondered if this was the friend that Samuel had talked about. Bessie stopped behind Samuel. She glanced in Michael's direction and coughed twice, but didn't continue forward. You came with Samuel? A woman with wavy hair, red lips, and white, slender fingers took her cigarette and turned her head slightly to glance at Bessie before blowing out a smoke ring. Bessie looked down and saved the documents Daniel had sent before replying in low spirits. 
Yeah. The woman looked her up and down, leaned over to extinguish the cigarette in an ashtray, and smiled. You're still in school, right? Students nowadays are really... Samuel sat down in the seat that Robert had given up and saw that Bessie didn't follow him. Bessie, he called, interrupting the woman. Sit here. He pointed to the seat next to Michael and motioned for her to sit next to him. He reached out and knocked on the table again, lifting his chin for the server to come over. Give me a cup of hot milk. There were all kinds of weird requests, and the server didn't dare judge any of them, so he went to get a cup of hot milk immediately. Bessie went over to Samuel. The woman next to her, who had been smoking, turned pale and her hand trembled. Marvin sat on the sofa opposite Michael and Patrick. He had already asked the server for a tea set. He prepared tea for each of them. When he heard Samuel, he looked up expressionlessly and asked, You're not drinking tea? No. Samuel leaned back and propped his legs up. My father said last night that tea disturbs our quality of sleep. He thought for a moment and turned to look at Michael. Isn't that right, Michael? Michael sat up straight and he casually loosened a button with one hand and pushed a cigarette into the ashtray with the other hand. Hearing Samuel's words, he responded. Besides Patrick's stunned expression, even Robert turned his head stiffly and looked at Michael, who was serious. He still looked tired, as if he hadn't slept well. He looked noble and elegant, with defined features and not the least bit of sharpness in his expression, so that he didn't resemble a refined degenerate. A blonde man walked over holding a pool cue and patted Marvin, who was brewing his tea. Marvin, it's a big pity that you didn't come to your idol's banquet yesterday. Did you know a shocking event happened? Marvin raised his head at the mention of Sherry and raised an eyebrow. What? It was news that was released yesterday. Do you know who set this year's questions? The blonde man smiled. When he saw Bessie drinking coffee casually on the side, his eyes widened. The others didn't notice this and were all attracted to what he had just said. Samuel ignored him. Robert laughed. Sebastian, don't beat around the bush. Who was it? Can't you see that Michael is curious too? Sebastian Palmer was a classmate of Samuel's in university and was more sociable, so he had been in contact with Samuel, so much so that he had caught up with Michael's circle through him. Seeing that Michael was indeed looking at him, Sebastian felt nervous and lowered his voice. I also heard from Sherry that the head of 129 set the questions. 129's big boss was the first generation. Samuel didn't intend to talk to Sebastian, but he couldn't help but get curious after hearing this. Which leader? Morning Bird? Bad Dragon? Samuel had dealt with 129 deeply and knew the leaders who were often more active. Sebastian shook his head. Samuel frowned. Could it be that Jared set the questions? Nope, you absolutely can't guess it. Sebastian shook his head mysteriously and then dropped the bomb. It was a lone wolf. What the hell? Samuel shrieked, shocked. The glass in his hand turned over on the table, and the scarlet wine dripped onto the carpet. Robert also raised an eyebrow, even though he wasn't very interested in the matter. That number one who refuses to take my order? Robert had also placed several orders. They had all been to Trace Daniel, and he had even placed an order for triple the price but 129 didn't even look at the order, much less accept it. Now it's lively. Marvin couldn't help but look up and put down his teacup. Aren't there many people going after Lone Wolf? No wonder my idol didn't come out today. This year's pressure must be greater than in previous years. Michael also leaned on the sofa and squinted slightly at Sebastian. I'm going out for a breather. Bessie lowered her head. She listened seriously to them, but after hearing this, she couldn't help but excuse herself. Michael glanced at her. The building was safe and the servers knew to keep their distance. The top floor wasn't accessible to ordinary people and nobody dared offend them at will. Okay, don't go too far. Michael's hand knocked on the teacup and he said calmly, Your grandma told me to look after you. Bessie left. Michael glanced at the people in the room. Samuel also reacted. You, 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 and you. He reached out and pointed at a few people. 
Throw out your cigarettes right away. There's a student present. Then he told the staff to come in and open the vent. As soon as Sebastian saw Bessie, he knew that the friend Samuel had mentioned was her. After seeing their movements, his thoughts grew deeper. At the end of the corridor on the top floor, a man in a suit and leather shoes stood in front of a woman with a camera, hiding her presence. The woman's face was clear, but her eyes behind the lens were black and her voice was stern. Kane, I already told you I'm investing 129, not because of your little mistress. Do you understand? Then that's the best. The man stepped aside and looked at the woman indifferently. The phone in his pocket rang and the man immediately picked up. His voice became gentler as he said, Hello? Okay, I'll come right away. He hung up the call. I agree with what you said last time. After one year, our agreement will end automatically. He glanced at the woman and turned directly to press the elevator door. The doors closed. The woman lowered her camera and then dialed Jared's number. But she saw someone not far away and paused and rubbed her eyes. What the hell? This is crazy. She took the camera and walked forward. Little student! Clarissa approached Bessie and saw that it was indeed her, so she hung up her phone immediately. Why are you in Evanston? I just got here. Bessie didn't expect to see Clarissa here and paused. You're not at the border anymore? I just came back for some small news. Clarissa pinched Bessie's face. Wow, it's so squishy. Come to think of it, you came to Evanston and didn't call me or Jared. Are you itchy for a beating? I'm here to deal with private matters and I'm going back the day after tomorrow, so I didn't want to disturb you. Bessie let her pinch her face frivolously. You don't plan to see the rest of them. Clarissa took off her glasses and smiled. Nobody except me and Jared knows that you're a girl. Bessie put her phone back in her pocket. Next time, maybe. The two of them exchanged a few more words. Sebastian came out of the room with his phone. He was specifically looking for Bessie and saw her talking to Clarissa at a glance. Bessie. Sebastian walked towards them and paused when he saw Clarissa. This is... Clarissa turned and looked at Sebastian, then reached out and put on her glasses. I'll leave first. Bessie's friend is pretty cool. Sebastian smiled. He saw a thread on the shoulder of Clarissa's clothes and asked casually, What does she do? Bessie looked politely at Sebastian. She's a paparazzo. Oh. Sebastian nodded and stopped talking about Clarissa. Then he apologized deeply to Bessie for not going to Samuel's dinner yesterday. It's okay, Bessie turned and replied coolly. The two of them returned to the room. Sebastian punished himself with three large glasses of wine on the spot and apologized to Bessie and Samuel. Does Bessie play pool? After drinking three glasses of wine, Sebastian took the initiative and handed the pool cue to Bessie. Bessie looked down at her phone. Michael put the stick to the side and said casually, She doesn't. Sebastian retracted his hand in shock. Since there was a high school student with them, they left before noon. After Michael and the rest left, Sebastian sighed in relief. Robert, who is that girl? Sebastian asked. He ran through a list of people with the last name Miller in the capital and couldn't find anyone who fit her. She's from Chicago. Robert stood up calmly and patted his sleeves. She's an ordinary high school student, protected by Michael, but don't spread this outside. Sebastian nodded. No wonder, but how does she know the paparazzi? Paparazzo? Robert squinted. When I went outside to look for her, I saw Bessie talking to a friend. Then she told me she was paparazzi. Sebastian saw Robert was silent and called his name again. It's nothing. Robert walked towards his car. He thought of the word, showman. Was she just a paparazzo? Sebastian didn't speak and glanced at Michael and the others. Someone asked cautiously, Sebastian, is Bessie Samuel's friend? Didn't he say she was from Chicago? Why is she with Michael? Yeah, even Sherry. Didn't you hear what Robert said? Do I need to tell you the consequences of speaking about this? Sebastian interrupted and glared at them. Perhaps it's only for a while, but don't mention this anywhere. Of course, he didn't quite understand it himself, but Bessie indeed looked good. The next day, Bessie got up early and couldn't sleep. 
so she took a pen and got a blank piece of paper from the staff to write a note to Noah Hyber. After a while, someone knocked on the door. Samuel and Michael knew she wasn't leaving, and they came to play with her early in the morning. Wait a while, I'll go wash my face. Bessie opened the door, pressed the note under a book, and went to wash her face. Okay. Michael sat by the window and pulled on his collar while flipping through her book casually. Samuel leaned on the table and watched as her phone lit up. He exclaimed, Bessie, a classmate named C just sent you a video. Episode 121, A Meeting at Northwestern University A classmate named C? Don't worry about it. Bessie lowered her head and washed her hands. She didn't have to look at it to know that it was Jared. Clarissa probably mentioned that she was in Evanston. Because of her tight schedule, 